so we can go ahead and uh, talk about that. So, are we ready? Let's go for it. All right, welcome everyone, and uh, today uh, we are going to talk about Intro to uh, the Auction House. So welcome again to uh, those viewers. Uh, another brought to you by Inevitable Structures, part of the 3D Game Labs uh, quest line called Ready to Trade. So, as the title indicates, we'll talk about the Auction House. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about what can be traded, and then what we'll do is we'll talk about what, uh, what the Auction House is, and then we'll talk about how it works. We'll talk about some basic strategies, and then we'll compare some realms. And the reason is, is that is that we have some people who will be on Area 52. We also have some people who will be on Sisters of the Loom. So uh, those are two. Uh, we'll actually be able to compare two different economies, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, a little bit more than we expected, but hey, we roll with it. So first of all, let me go ahead and introduce the others that are with us today. So my other co-presenters today are Kay and Izzy. So Kay, go ahead and say hi. Hey everyone, um, I'm Kay Novak. I'll be the person who will be reporting from um, Area 52 and we should have a bit of fun with that because it's a really hugely active economy and when you compare it to things, when you compare it to Sisters of Loon, you could say that you could, you could even consider starting the students out on, on Sisters of Loon and then moving them up over to Area 52. All right, thank you. Uh, Nada, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Izzy. Uh, so, um, one of my tunes is Nada Lemur, so that's what Chris is calling me, Nada. And let's see, what shall I say? Actually, I'm here to enjoy this session with the rest of you, find out what you know, vast knowledge Chris has about the auction house, and also Kay has vast knowledge, because they do a lot of arbitraging, so this should be a very interesting session for you all. Welcome. Thank you. We also have Kim and Benny from the 3D Game Lab, so uh, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, they'll be chiming in when they have some questions uh, later on, I'm, I'm sure. So we'll go back to the slides real quick, and uh, then what we'll do is uh, we'll go ahead and talk about the things that can be, be traded. So first thing we get is we get raw materials. With World of Warcraft, there are several different things you can do. We call them professions. And they're typically broken into two types. There can be crafting and there can be gathering. And so with gathering, you're gathering things like herbs or leather, hides. These are all things that you can gather. Uh, you can also do farming in World of Warcraft. Also, sometimes food items will drop from uh, animals that you kill and things like that. So these are all raw materials. And they can be, be traded, uh, freely traded, uh, whether it's on the auction house or between players. Uh, it's something that you can, you can go ahead and do. Uh, the other thing out there is you can trade gear, and gear by far is, is by far and wide probably the largest thing that we have as far as being, um, you know, traded between the different auction houses. And so what you have here is that with the gear, it really depends on the type of gear. And so what I mean by that is is BOE, BOA, BOP, or soulbound. So what does that mean? Well, basically what happens is this, is whenever you pick up a piece of gear, it can either be buying when picked up, also known as BOP, and this is most of the gear that you get from quests and bosses. So uh, typically uh, when it drops off of something that you've beat up or killed or completed a quest, you'll get gear and it automatically is bound to you. So once you pick it up, obviously it's bound to you and becomes something called soulbound. So really that BOP and soulbound are, are pretty much the same because the item will change from the category of bind when or bind on and it'll turn into soulbound. So soulbound is stuff that you're wearing. Uh, so BOP automatically turns to soulbound, which means the only thing you can do with, it, do with it is you can wear it or you can sell it to a vendor. So next up is BOE. BOE stands for bind when equipped. So what that means is that you get it, you can loot it, it does not automatically turn soulbound, it's still there, you're able to trade that and you're able to sell that. And actually, that really is what you're selling. Um, so when it comes to there, that's what you're looking at. And naturally, sort of your normal rule of thumb is the BOE gear is pretty much everything you see in the auction house being sold is whenever it's buying when equipped. The other type of gear we talked about was BOA. BOA is buying on account. These are items that you can actually send to any of your characters that are on the same realm, regardless of faction. So uh, you can send, it, send an, a BOA item from your Horde character to your Alliance character and vice versa. 
So uh, typically these are heirlooms, which are pieces that help you level faster. So um, we'll, we talked we talk about that in our inevitable instructor line of, of videos where we talked about gearing up and how people can, can quickly gear up. So those are different things that are out there. There's also some different weapons you'll see that are buying an account at the higher levels. Um, you know, World of Warcraft is selling uh, vanity items right now, uh, headpieces. You might see them uh, whenever you when you go to your launcher, uh, and they're trying to get people to buy those. Those are those are buying on account, which means you can send them to any any character on your account. So those are things that you're looking at. And again, the limitation is they have to be in the same realm. You can't trade. Uh, for instance, you can't send an heirloom gear on Sisters of the Loon through the mail to a character on. Uh, Area 52. You'd actually have to transfer the character with the heirloom to Area 52. So that's just sort of the limitations you have there. Now, how can you tell what type of gear it is? Well, basically what it is, it's on the tooltip. So what happens is when you go ahead and you move your mouse over top of an item, you get a little tooltip pop-up like this. And I, I blew it up here so that we can see it a little bit better because this when you share screen, it's kind of hard to see it sometimes. Um, but basically what it is, is you'll see. It'll have the name of the item. So in this case, the Temple Vant Bracers of the Beast, it'll say the item level, and it'll give you a whole bunch of other information. But if you look at it, right below the item level, it says bind when equipped. So this is a BOE piece, which means it can be traded. And you can also see all the other, all the other information that's there. And so this is the sort of stuff that, that the players are looking at. They're looking at the gear saying, well, how much, uh, you know, what stats am I getting from the gear? What bonuses do I get from the gear? Uh, and that's really sort of what the players look for. As, as a seller, as the person trying to, to sell this, uh, you're looking at it and say, okay, so first of all, you've identified it's a, it's a buy when equip gear. And then the other thing is, is you'll see the name. The name has a color. So this is a green color. So commonly you'll hear the gear referred to in terms of color. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's go ahead and let's move towards the auction house. So really what we have here in the auction house is that uh, we really have a, a nice setup. You have to go ahead and you, and you do have to, for the most part, whenever you're in-game, you'll be going to an in-game auction house. And so all you need to do is you need to find that auctioneer, wherever that auctioneer is. So uh, we'll go ahead and switch to Kay's screen so she can show us uh, the auction house. All right, let me uh, switch to mine real quick. So what you'll do is uh, basically you'll run over here. And so I'm in the Goblin Slums. And it's a nice place because they've sort of covered, even though it's a slum, it's a nice place because it's covered different places uh, as far as, you know, where everything is at. It looks like I'm having a little bit of screen share fun. So we'll see if it pops back up. So uh, what you'll do is you'll go to your uh, auction house person, and then basically all you do is you look for the auctioneer. Uh, usually there's also a sign out in front of the auctioneer as well. And so basically you will talk to the auctioneer, and this is sort of what you'll see. You'll see this nice little breakout of a little window pop-up uh, that sort of says, okay, you now you can browse the options. And it gives you lots of different, different things to play with here. So one of the first things you want to do, we'll go back to the slides here, is where are these located at? Well, here's what happens. They're located in every, in every capital city in the original content. So uh, what I mean by that is, is I mean Vanilla WoW and I mean uh, basically the expansion um, as you go out. So what we have is that there are, there are auction houses located in the major cities. So Orgrimmar, Silvermoon, Thunder Bluff, and Undercity. These are really sort of the places that have the auction houses uh, that uh, most people will use. So if you're in-game, this is how you'll access them. There are two types. There are faction auction houses, which are the ones I just mentioned. And they, that means you can only sell to people who are on your realm and are also uh, in your faction. Now, World of Warcraft has just implemented a uh, cross-realming, so you can also sell to people uh, as they've merged some of the realms. So they also share some of the auction houses. So there are things that are there that you can look at. The other thing that's out there is a neutral auction house. And neutral auction houses allow you to sell things to other factions. So this allows you to go ahead and allows you to 
uh, sell to somebody who is on the alliance side if you, if you so choose. Um, the thing about this is you cannot sell it to yourself, uh, so you have to have at least an accomplishment, accomplice if you want to move items from one faction to the other. And the neutral auction houses are limited to only two places, and that is Booty Bay and that is Gadgetstan. So really those are the only two places you can go ahead and get a hold of the neutral auction house. Now, notice I said while you're in game. So, what I mean by that is that World of Warcraft now offers the mobile armory. And so what that is, is basically it's a mobile app that you can put on your item. So we have a comment. So uh, Betty's asking, how about creating a clearinghouse between realms? Several technical problems, but doable. Uh, really, when it comes to a clearinghouse between realms, uh, the only way you can move items from realm to realm is you would have to have a, a item. You have to have a character uh, of a certain level to be able to carry everything over, and you would actually have to pay for a character transfer from one realm to the other. So you're paying real money to transfer them. Uh, typically, it's about $25 to $30, uh, and basically what it is is you would transfer them to uh, move over to the realm that you want. So, for instance, if you had a character in Sisters of Elun who was loaded and you filled up their banks and you filled up their bags and you gave them all the money you had, uh, there is a gold limit, so the character has to be a certain um, level to do that. And then also you have to uh, go ahead and then transfer them to the other realm, which you pay the realm transfer fee. And then your character, then you can just send that character to the to that end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, it's kind of it's kind of hard. Um, it, it really at this point in time, most most people aren't really worried, aren't trying to do cross realm. Uh, I mean, sorry, should say realm transfers to move from place to place. So that's really sort of the only problem that you have. Um, you know, you could you could probably work as an alternative economic model as far as you know if you had a character on Sisters of the Loon where you had similar stocks um, on both sides, and you would basically uh, have, that, have that seller, uh, very much like some of the Middle, Middle Eastern um, banking practices, where basically uh, one person in one place uh, records the, uh, the deposit or the request, and uh, you know, basically the correspond covers the corresponding asset transfer, and then someone someplace else then provides that material. So for instance, if you gave me 100 gold because you wanted to get um, you know, five stacks of, of uh, fool's cap or whatever, I could take your gold on, on uh, yep. So, yeah, Betty's saying exactly, like Europe in the 17th century. <laughs> yes, it, it's fun. Uh, oh, for those of you watching, Ben, Benny actually is uh, an economist, so uh, he is looking at the history, of, talking about the history of, of economics, so uh, very cool. And, and the one thing that I'd like to add, while this wasn't done so much for trading purposes, we do know of one person who transferred from, from a high, um, a high density server to Sisters of Balloon, which is a, a low, <laughs> a low density server. Um, what the person did was they were way past the gold limit for transfer. So what they actually did was they bought a huge amount of things <laughs> from the auction house that were really high priced. So what they ended up doing was spending a lot of their gold on, on buying things, and at and at that point in time, I believe it was Blood Spirits, which were maybe 10k, 10,000 gold a pop and they filled their bags up with them and then came over with, with, the, uh, with the amount that they were allowed. And I don't know for certain, we'll put a link to the website that tells you exactly what the amount limits are for character transfers, but that's how that person, that, that's how that person dealt with the fact that they could not transfer with the wealth that they had over, over to another server. Yeah, I and mean, there's different ways you can do that because, again, your money, there are gold limits and then um, you obviously have bag limit spacing as well. So there's a couple different areas there that you're, you're looking at for optimization. So uh, the other thing is is that if we go ahead and look at the um, my screen share, you'll see that this is what the mobile app will look like. So what it does is you can download it on either a Mac or an Android phone, and really what it does is it allows you to go ahead and access... So when you log in, you get this menu here. 
And then what you do is you click on the auction house, and then what it allows you to do is it allows you to search the auction house, it allows you to buy things out, it allows you to sell things. Um, apparently he's selling baby sharks. That sounds very illicit. Uh, but actually they have lots of pets here in uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, you can also access the guild chat from there as well and see who's online when. So the, the mobile app does have a lot of different uses that are out there. You can also communicate um, as well. And Kay has a bit of a story about the mobile app and how she's used it in the past. Well, um, first of all, it's great for the auction house. And, <laughs> and the thing of it is um, a lot of our guildies, especially our Inevitable Betrayals official um, guild fisherman and financial officer, <laughs> he, um, he uses the mobile app quite a bit. And I'll put some links to some things like a blog post he wrote on it and maybe a blog post I might have wrote on it too. Um, most people get, get the mobile, most people get, <laughs> actually, yeah, Benny said great for long faculty meetings. Absolutely, okay. It's, okay, playing the auction house is like a game within the game. Okay, it real it really is a mini game inside, and um, it is a lot about strategy. And the thing about it is, as as you're learning it, you will learn who your competitors are on the on the realms, and you will look to see how you can <laughs> how you can underbid them, undercut them. Um, you'll end up arbitraging a whole lot. So you always, if you are going to play the auction house. You want to make sure you have plenty of bank space, and you might have a uh, have a character or a tune just for the auction house, and you might have an additional one, uh, another bank tune just to store what you're planning to arbitrage off of the auction house. But as far as the mobile app, the mobile app, um, besides letting you play the auction house, it all it also lets you look at at different things. Like at least you take a peek at your character, and it really allows you to communicate with the guild even when you're not logged into the game. And I think that's what Chris was really referring to, that um, when we were, when we, we've been at conferences, and especially like the opening ceremony of, of the ISTE conference, we were able to tweet <laughs> to our guild, <laughs> or, or I should say, use the guild chat to let our guild know about us being up on stage for the opening ceremony, and, they, and, you know, and let them know we were, we were taking pictures, and, and, and just basically communicating with them. Um, also, during some time, so, during some natural disasters over the past two years, it's also how we've checked up and and kept in contact with guildies just to make sure that they were okay. So besides being this, besides being great for for you playing the auction house, it's also a great communication tool. <laughs> And so that's the nice thing about the, the mobile app um, that you have there. So, so really the big thing about the mobile app is that it allows you to really access the auction house whenever and wherever. Um, the only time you cannot access the auction house is if you're actually logged into the game uh, on that tune. So what's interesting about it is that it does allow you to log into other realms and sell stuff on other realms. So if you're on... If you're online and you're just sort of either flying from someplace to someplace or you're waiting for something, you can also just pull up your mobile app and you could also pull up a character on another realm and they could be trading as well. You could be doing auction house. So it makes it makes really it makes it a lot easier, especially for those of you that are going to be playing on the both realms where you're looking at both Sisters of Loon and Area 52. You can access both auction houses, um, uh, you know, basically the same way. And uh, you just go ahead with the, the using the mobile app for that. There is a limit. You can only have up to 200 items on the auction house at any time. I know it sounds like a lot, but once you get into the game here, it's not a lot. Uh, so it's pretty easy to get, get capped out. So just be aware of that. You do have a 200 item uh, limit on the auction house at any given time. And that is uh, game wide. So it's 200 items over the entire game. So uh, you just have to watch out for that. Uh, but again, those, those, that mobile app is very, very nice and really allows you to go ahead and utilize uh, a lot, lot of the game, access that game, and open that part of the game up. So one of the big questions we have is, uh, well, how does the auction house work? Well, with that, we just sort of wanted to sort of walk you through it. It's a lot easier than trying to type it all up uh, because there are so many filters here that you can utilize, and there's so many things that help you out uh, for what you want to look for. So one of the first things we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll look at the auction house here that I have up on my screen. And then what you'll do is you can see, uh, we'll start here on the right-hand side. If you have a specific item you're looking for, you can either type in the name 
or a shortcut is if you're trying to sell something in your in your bags, uh, what you'll do is you can go ahead and simply hold down your shift button and then left click. And then what it'll do is it will open up, it'll automatically pre-fill the name. And once you have the name here, you can click search. And so I can see, okay, here's all the other people who are selling uh, the bronze bar for different prices. You know, if I wanted to sell this, I have 19 stacks, so I'd be looking at around where the 20 is or where the 10 is. Notice when you, whenever you mouse over them on the tooltip in game, it does give you the price per unit breakout, and it also gives you the buyout per unit. So here's the thing. With World of Warcraft, you can either bid on an item or you can buy it out. Now, as a seller, you can also just set something to be a bid. And if you want to set something to be a bid, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But those are sort of the, the mechanics you have. So the options you have as a buyer is you can bid or buy out. As a seller, you can either have an open auction for however long you, you're, you want to set it for, or what you have is you can have a, uh, a buyout price. So you name, basically the way to think about it is the lower price, the bid price, your starting price, is your reserve price. It's the least amount of gold you're willing to accept for the item. The buyout is obviously your target price or what you, what you hope to get out of it. So that's sort of the way this auction house works. So um, those are things that, that you just sort of look at. Now the other nice thing about this feature is say you're, you're brand new to the game and you're only a couple levels, you have some gold, you're trying to figure out what you want to get. Well, actually what you can do is you can actually put your levels up here on the level range button. And you can simply say, okay, so say you're level 10. So we'll go from level 5 to level 15, something around what we want. Um, and then basically we'll say we're looking for armor. And then... Um, Obviously, depending on what character you are, in this case, I'm a warlock, so I can only wear cloth armor. So I click on the cloth down here on the filter side, and then I click search. And what it'll do is it'll give me a list of all of the items that show up um, that I can go ahead and buy that meet my criteria of my level range search. Now, notice that some of them are, are, are sort of red, and other ones are highlighted. So the ones that are red they are ones I, I cannot wear currently. So it tells me I can wear a, uh, a different level. Uh, so in this case, it's level 14. I can't, I'm not quite at level 14, so I can't wear them. Notice also it shows you what you're currently wearing. So on the right-hand right side, there's two tooltips. So when I moused over that piece, I got the one on the left, which tells me about the piece. And then I have the one on the right, which tells me about what I'm currently wearing uh, and what I'm seeing. Now, some of these tooltips is because I'm using an add-on that helps me with this. And so uh, that'll be something we'll talk about in our next presentation. We talk about the meta sites and the other tools and techniques that we use to sort of sort of make playing the game and make using like looking at the markets easier for us. So what we look at here is that uh, we have this. You can see here's a level 14. It says the time left on the auction. If you mouse over it, it says there's greater than 12 hours on very long. There's 2 to 12 hours left on this auction that is long, and it tells me who the seller is. So it's not quite a, uh, a closed uh, bidding process. And uh, also we have the current bid. So the first, the price on top, the lowest price is the reserve price or the most recent bid on that item. The price at the bottom is the buyout price. So this is the price that you can, you can have it free and clear. The one thing about World of Warcraft that, that really is, that people are really looking for is they're, they're checking out and saying, okay, well, one thing games are, just like in real life, a lot of gamers aren't really good at uh, dealing with game delayed gratification. So a lot of people want it really quick. So uh, what some people do is that basically you are, you're going ahead and you are, um, you'll get a really low you know, reserve price to start off. And then the other thing you'll end up with is that you will end up with a, uh, an exceptionally high uh, price to go ahead and actually buy out. So that's a little thing you have to watch out for is you want to look at both prices. You don't want to look at just look at one. You want to look at both of the prices. So um, that is something to be a little tip to watch out for. Um, the other thing is, is that 
Um, we'll continue on with talking about the filters that are here. And there are plenty. I mean, I encourage you to play around with them and get a feel for them. But uh, we'll go back to the original set, so I'll go ahead and... Uh, so on the right hand, on the left hand side, they give you weapon, armor, container, consumables, glyphs, trade goods, recipes, gems, miscellaneous, quest, and battle pets. So there's a lot of different things that are out there. There's a lot of different things you can filter. So these are the base things. When you click on them, they give you even more options to filter your searches with. So uh, what you'll do is, as you're looking for, if you're buying it, what you're doing as a buyer is you're going to know exactly what type of weapon you can. You're limited to, or at least you should. You'll know exactly what type of armor you can you can wear, and uh, containers are like bags. If you want bigger bags, um, there are things that are there. Uh, consumables would be like potions, food and drink, bandages, uh, scrolls, different things like that. Uh, glyphs are something you get access to once you hit uh, level 25. Again, those are things that you use as you get into the game. Uh, you have trade goods, you have recipes. So this would be for the different crafters that are out there, the different professions that are out there. Um, then you have gems, again, this is something that you'll deal with at a higher level. Uh, then you have a couple different quest items would be some items that you use for quests. You can sell them. So the other thing that's out there is uh, here at Rarity. Um, so we're going to go across the top again. So we have name, level range, and then we have Rarity. What Rarity does, it tells you uh, what type of items you want. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit when we start talking about the colors again because uh, what Blizz has done is they've color-coded um, all the items based on what sort of rarity or quality those, co those items are. You know, the other useful feature here, again, as, you, as you're perusing the auction as a seller, as a buyer, is usable items. You can click so that way only things that you can use will show up. So if I click search here, it will only be things I can use. Now, obviously, I can refine this search by clicking I'm looking for armor that I can use, and it will only show me armor that I can use. So it's a really quick, easy way to see that. The other thing I can do is I can also display it on my character. So I can double check that, and what happens is that the little tooltip says, control left click will let me look at uh, what the item will look like possibly on my character. So in my case, I can go ahead and do this, and see it pops up a little window off the side. I can say, this is what my character will look like uh, if he had worn, if, he, if I purchased that. So. And the reason why I bring this up is because that's become an interesting secondary market, which we'll talk a little bit later in this presentation about, where people are, are changing, are looking for a specific way to get their character to look. Because in World of Warcraft, you can't change as much as you could in like Second Life or some of the other virtual worlds out there, but you can still customize your character and get a look that you want. Uh, obviously, you have search. You have little buttons here to preview. In case there's more than one page of items to, to sort through, you can use preview or next. Now, that's for if you're buying or if you're searching or you're doing market research trying to look for how much a piece costs or, or whatnot. What you do as a seller is, um, really what you're looking at as a seller is you're going to go ahead and you just click on the auctions tab. And uh, actually down here, right in between where it says browse and bid, uh, browse bids and auctions down at the bottom, bids is for if you're a buyer. So if you bid on something, all your bids will show up here. Uh, on this screen. So currently I'm not, I have not bid on anything. Um, but you'll see that. Next up you have the auctions. This is a screen where you will use it. Simply all you use in game is you grab what you have, you drag it over. So you're holding down the left clip, left button and you're dropping it into the uh, window up here. So now it tells you stack size, number of stacks. Uh, you can actually set your price per stack or per unit. It's up to you. And then you can go ahead and you can talk about the pricing. And then also the thing about here, so you can set your price, so gold, silver, copper, that's the currency of the game. Uh, with World of Warcraft, you, you will always get your currency in this level. Uh, you cannot sell. Uh, it's against terms of service to sell World of Warcraft goods for real money. Um, so that's something you're not allowed doing. Uh, so um, if you do do that, you're breaking terms of service. And if you get caught, they'll basically suspend your account. And so you can set your starting bid. So again, this is your reserve price. This is the starting bid. The buyout price is what the, 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 the amount that you're willing to, to part with your item. The biggest thing about selling things in the auction house is don't have seller's remorse. Uh, so just learn from mistakes. So you can set it for a 20-hour auction, a 24-hour auction, or a 48-hour auction. Um, so those are your, your time frames. 
what it is, is on this item here, it doesn't change, but you're, you also have to pay a deposit. So every item that you post onto the auction house, there is a fee associated with that. And so you will pay that fee. And then what happens is that the auction house will take a percentage of your final sale and uh, they'll give it back to you. So sometimes the deposit is greater than the percentage that uh, um, uh, than the amount is. And so uh, what it'll do is the auction house will refund you the difference. And so you get this nice little thing on your in your mailbox that says your item has sold and it'll say this is what you sold it for, this is what the user fee is, here's if you paid in excess of the user fee, here's your amount back. Uh, based on your deposit, and then basically you go from there. So with a deposit, it's pretty much a sunk cost. You pretty much lose that deposit um, most of the time. Uh, however, uh, on some items when you do that, you actually will get some of that deposit back. So uh, it really depends on the percentage that you have, uh, percentage that you're paying. So the next step is... And when you're ready, you just would create the auction. So what I can do here for the rough blasting powder, I can say, okay, is there any rough blasting powder on? So again, that is shift left click to get the automatic fill. I can search for it. There's nothing on uh, there. So um, really, I really have to go ahead and figure out my own pricing for that. Uh, I don't want to do that because I have to actually use that for the, my engineer uh, a little bit later. So, But that's sort of how the auction house functions. So there's some of the functions that are there. So again, you go into the auction house, it's all blank, you start playing around with the tools that are there. And, and actually the really cool thing about the in-game model is it really does allow you to go ahead and really be very specific on how you're sorting your items and how you're sorting everything to make sure that you are getting exactly what you're looking for. So uh, definitely um, have some fun with that, get used to playing around with that, and uh, um, get a feel for uh, how to use that auction house feature in game. Now, again, you can also use the the Armory app. The Armory app does some things automatically for you. For instance, once you select an item to sell, it'll automatically pull up there and it'll automatically suggest a starting price for you. So the Armory app is a bit easier. It's a much a lot of people like the Armory app better than the actual in game interface, uh, which is which is really again why it's such a successful application because it solves a problem and makes it a lot makes it easier to do things. So that is sort of what the auction house is. So let's talk about start talking about basic strategies. Unless uh, I'll turn it over to Kay if she has something if she has something you want to add. Well, what I, what I was going to ask was, does anybody have any questions? And if you're going to start talking um, basic strategies, um, if anybody wants to talk about the basic strategy that they've used up until this point for the auction house. And, and I mean, I, I do know some guildies who are like, yeah, it's not worth it. It takes too much work. Oh, I will just go and vend everything. And, and of course, I, I, I kind of yell at them, all caps in text, about that. But <laughs> the, the thing of it is there are some people who, who very much make this part of the game and, and, and do get you know their fun flow in Fiero from playing the auction house and selling things at just that right amount or or buying low and then selling high. I, I mean, there's lots of people who, who get something from that. But then there's other people who who don't come over to the auction house unless maybe they have they're looking for that one piece of gear that they haven't gotten yet and they sell it really high. Then we have other people. Then there's other people we know who have high-level crafters, and the only time they go in the auction house is to sell um, whatever they've crafted that's really high level. Okay, so uh, Benny's actually talking about some of the strategies he's using, and he's saying that uh, he's uh, timing, looking at selling on Friday and buying on Monday. And a lot of that is, is in response to the fact that the, the population of the servers uh, skyrocket on the weekends. Uh, so that way uh, more people are on. And uh, also he said, so he's saying using an add-on like Auctioneer. So there are different tools that are out there that you can utilize. So um, definitely um, right on, spot on there uh, where there's lots of different things that you can go ahead and, and do different techniques. So um, sort of what I have on the slides here is that really uh, one thing to think about for gear is to know your color. So if it's gray, if the color is gray, it means it's poor quality. And basically most players review, view this as worthless, and it's best sold to a vendor. Uh, the term for that is vending trash. 
Uh, and so basically that's what it is, is uh, that's another way to make money. I mean, and that's, let's be honest, there, and if we're talking about business strategies uh, here, in, here in World of Warcraft, uh, one of the strategies to make gold is to simply go out and quest, go out and kill things, go out and play the game uh, as, the, as the developers intended you to do. And uh, that's a way to make money. You get money from turning in quests. You get money from the uh, the, the drops, the worth, the trash here, the gray items. Uh, you can sell those uh, at higher levels. Sometimes those gray items uh, can be worth a lot of gold. Like for instance, there are some gray items in uh, Mister Pandaria expansion that sell for that basically you can vend for a hundred to uh, two hundred gold uh, for it. So so those are things that you can you can do as you're grabbing stuff. So uh, that's just things to be aware of uh, as, you're, as, you're do, as you're going ahead and you're doing this is one way you can actually make money. And, and one of the, the, the normal ways people make money is just by questing. It's just by questing, just by running dungeons, just by playing the game uh, without using the auction house. They are going ahead and they're making money off of that. So, so there is some things there. Uh, so that's one way to bring in sort of, it's not a passive cash flow, like an auction house is, it's more of a much more active way of doing it, and and it's more more of it's sort of like the job. That's the grinding in World of Warcraft is doing all of that. So um, you know if if you're if you're looking at just playing the auction house, that's one way of doing it. But if you're looking at again another way to generate funds, one way to do it is simply running the, just playing the game. The item other items that are out there are white items, and these are common items, and uh, they typically are ingredients. So for recipes. Uh, however, they're also used for normal pets and vanity items, and so that's some things you have to be watch watching out for. So we talked we talked about that a little bit earlier about people wanting to change the way they look and wanting to do things. Well, guess what? Vanity items are one of the ways to do that. Uh, you know, the ones I the one I picked up once was a silver was antique silver cufflinks is what I picked up, and they were white. And 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 I went ahead and I was able to sell them for uh, three hundred gold. So, uh, and it's a white item, so usually uh, people will either sell that cheaply or whatever, um, but uh, you just need to be aware of what's going on and what the items might be used for. So next up is green. Uh, green is uncommon. It's typically your largest selection of items you'll find in the auction house. Uh, really what it is is this is stuff drops uh, all the time. It is green gear. Typically, as, as you're, if you are leveling up your character, uh, you'll be wearing a lot of greens. Uh, especially if you don't run dungeons. If you just run quests, you'll get lots of greens. Uh, the next up is blues. Blues are rare, and they're typically dropped from dungeon bosses. Um, or they're typically the end of a very long quest line. If it's a very challenging quest line, you'll get a blue. Uh, and like I said, so people talk in these, these terminologies. So a lot of times you'll hear greens. I'm looking for greens to disenchant, or I'm looking for things like that, or I'm looking for blues. Um, so that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the color of the name. So remember, back on the tooltip, uh, it shows you what color, what, what it says what the, what the item is, those vampire bracers of the bandit. Remember, the color of the, the lettering was green in the name of the item. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, the other thing about blues is they're typically your best quality pets, and uh, they're also the, typically the best in slot gear for non-raiders. So that's obviously going to make their prices increase versus what uh, a green of a similar level level would be. So that's something else you can look at is if is, is is that if you have a blue piece and you don't see something to compare it against, then you can go ahead and just set your own price based on if there's a a blue a green chest piece that has similar stats. Um, but uh, you look and see where that is. Again, the blues will be uh, more expensive. You sell you want to sell it at a higher price. Next up is purples. Uh, so purple is epic. These are typically rare world drops, which sell for a very, very high price if they're bind, a bind on equip. Uh, and remember, you can't sell BO, BOP or Soulbound or uh, BOA gear on the auction house. Uh, so you can only sell uh, buy when equipped. So uh, they also drop off raid bosses. So if you do raid bosses um, that start at level 60 is when you can start doing raids. Uh, they basically are at the end, end level for for each expansion, so 60, 70, 80, 85, and 90 are the, the rating levels that are out there. Um, the other thing is you can also craft high-end uh, mats uh, that are purple. Uh, and again, uh, the, they typically are the, the, the uh, materials for the, the pieces that were the, the best pieces uh, that crafters could make for each expansion. 
So you'll see that there as well. Then you also have orange, which is legendary. Uh, orange are extremely, extremely rare items. Um, they, they really drop every once in a while. It's typically resulting from extended game gameplay. A lot of them are BOA, a lot of them are, BO, are BOP, but some of them are, are buying when equipped. Uh, and also some can be crafted. So those are things that sometimes you'll see sold. Uh, a lot of them at this point in time are, are vanity uh, pieces. So in other words, what I mean by that is they aren't uh, they aren't really as good as some of the normal stuff, um, but basically what it is is people still get them for the look, for what they look like, and people will still get them uh, for what they can go ahead and um, uh, you know basically change them around and see if they like that look. So like I said before, we're sort of hitting out already. We're sort of covering some of this stuff. Is the colors are usually a really good heuristic to use. Uh, but there are exceptions, and, and what we're talking about is what we've been talking about. Some players are looking to customize their gear for aesthetic reasons, and what we do is it's called transmogging in the game. And what you can do with transmogging is simply what it does is you can go pay a fee to get a high-level piece that you're, you currently have uh, and, and basically change it to look like a, uh, another piece. So that's how you get the look that you want. So, for instance, if you didn't like the way your weapon looked, if you liked the way your old weapon looked, you could go ahead and you could pay a transmogging fee, and you could go ahead and, and get the old look of the piece you're replacing. Um, the big thing for that is you have to keep the item you want it to look like has to be in your bank. And there's also restrictions on what it is. So, for instance, if you're wearing plate and you wanted to transmog your gear and it looked like a, cloth, a piece of cloth, you can't do that. Uh, you can only transmog pieces that are cloth uh, into other pieces that are cloth. And uh, same thing with any other armor. Weapons are the same way. You can only trans you can always transmog uh, one-handed sword into a one-handed sword. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. And, and actually, that's a secondary market. You're seeing a lot of people look going back and farming old content simply to find these pieces and to sell them. So... Um, um, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, some of the people who like to, to play Blood Elf uh, paladins, female paladins, they, they like to buy certain plate sets because in good old World of Warcraft fashion, apparently uh, female, female plate wearers liked, are better off and better equipped that they only have to wear plate bikinis as opposed to wearing a full, full coverage uh, plate gear. So <laughs> uh, some people seem to like to have their... their uh, their blood elves, their blood elf uh, warriors and paladins running around in plate bikinis instead of uh, the big massive uh, uh, sets that the the male versions wear. So again, there's not that's just the way Blizz designed them. So people take advantage of that to get the look that they want, and they're willing to pay a lot of money for them. So uh, that's uh, we do have a, a guildy in the Neville Trail who does that a lot, uh, and that was uh, Jerry from last week. Uh, he does that a lot as well. So uh, as far as selling that gear and capitalizing on that. Uh, there's also a lot of websites out there to help identify what these pieces are. Uh, but again, we're going to give you a teaser for next session just to make sure you show up. And so the next session, we'll talk about that. The other thing to remember is that all items here in World of Warcraft are commodities. Uh, really, there is negligible difference between your version of it and someone else's. I mean, you can do, do some stuff to try to get more money out of it, like maybe you'll put an enchant on it or something like that. But the thing is, is most people don't even bother to do that because uh, people will just grab it and they'll put what, exactly what they want. So um, that's just something that people will do. So really, it's a commodity market. So right now, really uh, comparing on based on price works best, which is basically you just search for your item uh, and then you just undercut the others. Um, the nice thing about the WoW Army app is that automatically you can actually set that already so it'll set you uh, so that way your your pricing is you know one copper below the the current price. So um, that's the closest as you can undercut is one by one copper. Um, so there's different things you can play around, different strategies for that. You know you can play around with pricing like that and seeing whether people like numbers that end in five or zero, or if people like the 99 cent type version of selling. So there's a lot of different things you can play around with pricing there. And uh, again, if you're an educator in your class, you can have your students play around with it. So now the other thing is, is what happens if there's no other items to compare to? Well, one of the things you can do is you can search for a partial name. So like a lot of times you'll have the, like I said, like the great example we had earlier was the Vamp Bracers of the Bandit. Well, if I didn't see any brace, vamp, 
vamp bracers of the of the bandit out there, I can simply chop off of the bandit and just search for the vampire bracers. And there might be more more of them out there. They just have different names. There's different of those at the end of it. So that's another way you can look at to compare. Uh, because like, like all search engines, they only search for the information that you give them. Now, the mobile uh, Armory app uh, does this automatically. It just says, here's all of the same gear that has the first, the similar starting names. And so they just chop off the descriptors at the end, the of the, and they uh, just, just search for that initial term. Also, uh, research the item. Like, use the Google, Luke. Use the Google. So uh, there's different things you can play around with there as far as uh, making sure that you're able to go ahead and search for that. Again, we'll be addressing a lot of that in the, uh, the next uh, presentation. The other thing you can play around with as well is you can also look at cost plus pricing, which is basically looking at your cost plus your target profit. And, and then instead, if you don't really feel like researching that, you can just go ahead and say, okay, I'm willing to accept 20 gold for this piece, and then you just sell it for, you know, 15 to 20 gold. So those are things you can also play around with. Uh, it really depends on your mood, your time, how much time you have to play with. Again, most most auctions today are being done on the mobile app because it's just so much simpler to do that on the mobile app. Other things about strategies is just like in real life, do your research. Um, also think about your time. You know, are you making money back for what you're doing? Uh, if it took you a long time to get a piece, uh, you might want to uh, sell that at a higher price. Um, so again, uh, and remember, sometimes you can wait around for the right buyer. Uh, your buyer may not always be there. Uh, so there's different things that you can do. What I typically do is uh, when I have items that sell a lot, like for instance herbs, I'll probably only put them on a 12-hour 12 12-hour 12 auction. And the reason why I do that is because it's, you can get undercut so fast at certain times that I don't want to have to wait to get my, my herbs back in my in my mail to put them back up, to repost them on the auction house. Um, I don't want to wait 24 hours. I'm willing to wait 12 hours, and then I'll just repost them at a lower price. Um, the other thing is, is a lot of people playing the auction house use the 24-hour cooldown. So sometimes whenever the auction, when something's really selling, uh, 12 hours is really great because you can quickly uh, move your items, and move your inventory. Um, the other thing is, is learn from your mistakes. You will make mistakes. You will sell stuff, and then you'll go back to it, and you'll be like, oh, no. That was a transmog piece. I could have sold that for, you know, 30,000 gold. And I only sold it for five. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about that. You have to go back and just learn from that mistake. And we we have a comment from, from Benny. And what he's saying is that his mean on a different realm is in desperate need of living steel. <laughs> and, and you know, he, he wrote about made by alchemists and needed by engineers to craft the sky gold. Of course, the sky gold. OK, um, he just compared prices in Area 52. 487 gold versus 451 on Sisters of Maloon. Um, and and he, what he proposed was that, that this difference might be due to the different numbers of the two professions. And I'm guessing he means on the realms. Um, yeah, it can, it can be a lot of different things. Um, depending on the realms, first of all, with Living Steel, um, if there's lots of guilds with really strong tradition of guild crafters, that can make a difference because it might be that most people who say who say need it on one realm can get it from um, their guildies. And and I know when it comes to living steel, like in our guild, we 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 trade uh, our alchemists <laughs> you know, end up doing living steel and making things for for other guildies a lot. So that that can have an influence if it's really if there's really a lot of if there's a really a lot of guilds who make living steel for their guildies there might not be a lot of it on the there might not be a lot of it on the auction house and um, there's some other things that that there's some other things that you can also think about is because some of the other things that that you can think about is um, yeah I will tell you sisters of a loon versus um, versus area 52 when I compare the auction house area 52 makes sense to me Okay. <laughs> As a market, what I'm saying is that look, um, things sell high, they go fast. Um, with Sisters of a Loon, actually arbitraging 
actually works better because there's a lot of people I've seen who put things on the auction house who don't know the price. So as far as Sisters of the Loon, I see a lot of crazy high and crazy low prices. And naturally, I, I buy the crazy low prices and, <laughs> and then think about, you know, when is the best time to try, to try selling it at the crazy high prices. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris. He wanted to make a yeah, and there's also seasonality issues in here. Um, you know, a great example is small eggs. Um, is around the Christmas time, around the winter holidays, you'll see uh, a, a winter event, and one of the items you have to do is make gingerbread cookies, uh, which require you to have eggs. And so um, I can remember whenever we first started out, uh, both the K and I would run around and kill all these little poor little birds that dropped eggs. And uh, these eggs only sold for maybe 50 silvers, if that, um, during the normal part of the year. But during the seasonal time, um, they were selling for 5 to 10 gold apiece. Uh, and so uh, we made a killing on that. So, I mean, seasonality comes in. So it's a lot like real life. Is, is there seasonality effects that come in here? Supply and demand cause a problem. Right now with living steel, um, trillium bars that were used to turn into, into living steel by alchemists, uh, they're actually being they're actually required by blacksmiths now to uh, go ahead and make the new the new crafting uh, material to make the the higher level gear for 90. So so that's one of the reasons why living steel um, supplies may be down is because if I may if I'm somebody who has trillium bar I may not be be interested in in sending and, and basically having my having an alchemist make it into living steel. Because living steel is now only used for pets, um, and and not the best in slack gear. And instead, trillium, the trillium bar has to be used to be and consumed to make these new new items. So, make these new materials. So that's something else. So that's really what I mean by do your research. Is look and see what it is. Um, the other thing is is what Kay was referring to is doing that environmental scanning. You know, just watch the auction house. Uh, you know, decide what area of the auction house you want to get involved in. Do you want to get involved in the pet trade? Uh, which really sounds bad. Um, do you want to get involved in the in the herb in, in the herb market? Do you want to get involved in the food items, the food stuffs? Do you want to get involved in selling gear or selling weapons? Um, so there's different things that you can look at, seeing what you want to get involved in, and then it's just getting a feel for that market. So because uh, what you'll find on a smaller server like Sisters of Loon is you'll see that there's typically several major sellers uh, that you know by name within a couple weeks. And that, but however, in in something like Area 52, you'll see a much bigger list of sellers um, that are out there. It also depends on timing because um, right now uh, we've now switched over to Patch 5.4. Um, just after 5.4 came out, a lot of guild banks started um, trying to sell off stuff that were no longer useful to them in their banks uh, because there's better stuff to get out there, and so they're willing to do that. Um, I, I do not know. Betty, Betty just asked a question about um, researching games as far as it, it applies to getting uh, tenure at, at the college. And, and I mean, I, I really don't know on, on that one. Um, I would say that the person who's doing that a bit, it was Edward Castronova who did that in economics. So if you look up the name Edward Castronova, I believe he's at Indiana University now. But I think he switched from um, being a professor in economics that he switched over to being a, I, I think he's in a media communications and technology kind of department now. Now, I know there are our papers on economics in World of Warcraft. Um, not, not a huge amount, but there's some. Um, and as far as the, as in the education field and people publishing it for tenure, um, I don't know that they've gotten tenure based on it yet, but there's a lot of new um, PhDs who are publishing on it, say, in the past five years. So, so as far <laughs> so, <laughs> and and um, it's an economy. And quite honestly, Benny, and considering what happened at Bitcoin, and I don't know if everybody's been reading that um, a bit, um, a online auction house was just taken um, down by the FBI. 
It was called <laughs> it was called Silk Road. And what it did was it was absolutely black market. There's no question about that. But what they used was a virtual currency known as Bitcoin. And I mean, the thing of it is, I think looking at virtual economies and and having a broad range um, could be considered because you know it, it it's happening. <laughs> And, and as far as full professorship, that is really dependent on, on the college that you're at and whether that department and that college of whether it's business or you know or or economics and humanities or wherever you are, what they're willing to accept. So that, so that's my very 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 humble opinion on that. Yeah. And and like Chris put, gold farming, which we we did not incorporate into this quest line, but we do. But when Chris teaches this class, we do have a module on gold farming, and and even some like smaller discussions when it comes that can be translated to middle school and high school students about about digital citizenship, ethics, and and stuff like that on gold farming. Yeah, so there's definitely lots and lots of different things to think about and uh, and to talk talk about in in the and using games in your classroom. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can you can use this for, especially in the business area, especially in economics. Um, I'm really a strong believer in using this. It's a really good simulation, and and another thing about it is it's more relevant for a lot of our students. Uh, I find a lot of my students, while they may not play World of Warcraft, they do play games. And having them look at the economies and looking at the businesses in their games, it definitely makes it sort of much more relevant for those, especially those that, that don't necessarily have the work experience. So some other things you can do is the tools we sort of talked about. We talked about uh, websites. We talked about um, we talked about add-ons. We talked about apps that are out there. Um, so so really, those are different things that you're looking for and how you can go through it. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the comparison of uh, the two realms. So uh, here's some quick data I pulled up uh, right now. And basically that data is that uh, obviously Area 52, as we've been saying over, all, over and over and over again, is the much larger realm. Uh, I looked on, I looked on WOW, WOW Auction today, and basically the daily market volume of gold for Area 52 is 12 million. Uh, it was over 12 million gold. It's the fourth ranked economy out of uh, 492 possible realms on the U.S. And uh, basically, it is a player versus environment realm. Sisters of Illum, on the other hand, uh, has almost 2 million. Uh, so, so uh, Area 52 uh, has about six times the daily market volume uh, than Sisters of Illum. It is ranked 319th of 492, and it is also a role-playing realm. So um, we've talked about that. Size-wise, Sisters of Luna is a much smaller realm. Um, like I said a bit earlier, I think Sisters of Luna is a good job, is a, is a good study um, in looking at the big player, big fish in small ponds. So if you're looking for the, the evidence of monopolies and oligopolies and collusion and different things like that, um, probably going to see a bit more of that in Sisters of Illum, uh than necessary in Area 52. But I'll let Kay talk about Area 52. Okay, so what I've seen in Area 52 is that things sell fast, um, that there is a market for the lower level um, goods, um, commodities, and I should say equipment, and, and my rationale for that is people want to, it's a busy realm, there's a lot of 90s, people want to level fast, and have lots of gold, and they're probably, and they're probably on an alt. And, and so you should know, um, and this has even happened to our questers, it's difficult to make a tune here if you don't already have one. So chances are the person already has an alt here and is willing to, and you know, or I should say that what they're leveling up is an alt so that they're willing to buy things rather than spend the time, you know, trying to go out and get it for themselves. The other thing about having a lot of high-level tunes, chances are their guild bank is totally dedicated to raiding 
and rating goods and is not going to store low level things. And, and also with having a lot of 90s in your group. They might have bank tunes and stuff like that, but again, chances are they are not going to store low level goods. They're going to probably store what they consider the most valuable for what they normally play, and so that's probably higher goods. So low level goods sell pretty well in here. The other thing is that epic goods sell a lot too. Okay, people have money in here and they are willing to spend it. The other thing is that the auction house isn't the only place. Trade chat is wonderful. People are continually buying and selling things on here. So, so trade chat deals a lot with, with selling and most things that are put in trade chat, I will tell you, are usually um, above 10,000K. So above $10,000, <laughs> yeah, I mean so above 10,000 gold are being put up there. Lower level things, um, lower level things usually aren't. And the other thing about trade chat is remember you don't have the auction fee if you do it that way. Okay, and, and here I have here in trade right now, they're willing to sell it, somebody willing to sell living steel. The next thing is willing to sell reins of the swift spectral tiger. 375,000 <laughs> gold. So those are the kind of things you see sold here that you wouldn't necessarily see um, that you wouldn't necessarily see on um, Sisters of a Loon. Some of the other things is that people um, here offer their services a lot. You'll often see in trade chat willing to run you through this dungeon for this much gold. Another thing you see um, a lot in trade chat here is um, guilds being sold. Usually if you're on for at least about five minutes reading trade chat, you will read someone who is trying to sell a guild or someone who is trying to buy a guild. These guilds are usually level 25 um, guilds and they'll usually have the attributes. Oh, and I, I just want to say, like, I'm seeing here, willing to sell a sky golem in four days. <laughs> willing to sell ghost iron ore, 75 G a stack. Willing to sell coal fang stalker, level 25, um, 10,000 K or best offer. <laughs> so, um, as I'm, re I'm reading the things here. Uh, as we're going along. And so the thing of it is, this is a very, very active realm. And quite honestly, I have heard the comments from people saying that, that it might be a little too active for them. Well, actually, uh, Benny just said but he needs it on another realm. I'm going, well, actually, I believe the Sky Golem, your pets, your pet should be, it should be one of those pets that is shared across realm. Because uh, that's the other thing they do with pets now, is all the pets you have are shared with all your tunes. Uh, and most of your mounts are. I think the only mounts that aren't there, aren't shared, are ones that are uh, rare drops, or uh, and they're only sell, they're only, they're only shared. I think in that one realm. Uh, I don't know if they're all. I don't know if all mounts are cross realmed. But that's the other thing about it is right now with World of Warcraft, the new setup for Cataclysm is that your pets, uh, all your pets carry over. So that's why if you look at your pets now, you'll see that you probably have three or four. You might have three stacks of the same pet because if you had it on you know, several different characters, it'll all pop up now under it. So, so that's the other thing about it is that, is that you could actually buy pets or, or, you know, or a mount on another server and then you would still have access to it. You, may, you might still have access to it on every other server that you're on because so, uh, Warcraft has made that jump there. So that's also the change the way that people look at it. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Ah, yes, 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 that is a point. So uh, you do have to go ahead. <laughs> yes, yeah, so some, mount, some uh, pets do require that you have a, a, a certain profession skill to be able to access that pet. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So, so that's the thing. The other thing is I see with, uh, with the, the big difference is that things sell, the, the, the frequency of transactions are much higher on Area 52, so things sell faster than what you see on Sisters of the Loon. Um, they're much slower on Sisters of the Loon. You don't sell them as fast. The other thing is, is with Sisters of the Loon, um, again, you don't see quite the diversity of things being sold uh, on there. So that's one of the reasons why we targeted Area 52. But, but again, uh, if you can get in Area 52, that's that's wonderful. Uh, it's it's all like I said. It's the fourth rank economy. It really is an economics and a business a business person's playground when it comes to looking and seeing what's being bought and sold. 
and, and, and the rate at which everything's being bought and sold. Um, Sisters of the Loon is a very good server for those that are just getting in. I really like Sisters of the Loon um, because um, we use it for my college level class and uh, I like it because it's a role playing server so the language in itself is not too bad. So if you're looking at bringing in um, you know, your kids, there there is some adult language that occurs in, in every realm obviously regardless of whether it's uh, role-playing or player versus environment or whatever. The difference is, is with the role-playing server, you seem to get a little bit less of that. And, of course, you also have sensor filters on your, that, on your game that you don't have to worry about that as well, uh, unless the students take them off. Uh, but that's their own call there. Uh, but the thing about it is, is, is what I seem to find is the Sister Lou is a good way to sort of introduce people to it, um, and then, uh, then they can go ahead and compare and contrast with, uh, with something like uh, the monster that's in Area 52. Um, so, so that's sort of what we had for today, is just sort of talking about what's there. Again, uh, for those of you that are in the quest line, uh, feel free to join either Area 52 or Sisters of the Loon, or, or join both. Uh, like I said, it, will, it may take you some time to get onto Area 52. I would suggest if you're having trouble getting in, try it early morning or try it late at night. And what I mean by late at night is try it like after um, 12 p.m., uh, you know, 12 a.m. server time because uh, people, most people play, seem to play until about um, 12 a.m., 1 a.m. In, in server time. And if that doesn't work, then try getting up earlier uh, on your time if you can and coming in probably around 6, 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. server time. And server time is, by the way, central time here in the U.S., so um, that's sort of what you're looking at and seeing what works for you. Uh, both of them are really interesting. I look forward to uh, hearing from everybody on the, uh, the forums and hearing everyone from the discussion boards. So I guess we'll open it up for any last questions. So uh, Kim or Benny or Izzy, uh, do you have anything to say? No, I'm just taking it all in. Uh, very, very interesting. I'm kind of fascinated at this point, a little overwhelmed, but... I'll just take it one step at a time. Did you get that? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, nobody's oh, you're right. There, it Am is I a lot to take muted? in. <laughs> okay. <Yes>. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, that sounds like that's it. So we'll go ahead and we will wrap up the Hangout. So everyone have a great day, and thank you all for coming. Okay, bye. Goodbye.